What causes elbow dysplasia? Now this question has two versions. Version 1, what are the actual physical changes in a dysplastic elbow? And version 2, what makes those physical changes occur? Now to this day these questions trigger intense debate among specialists and the elbow dysplasia puzzle remains far from complete. My role in the next couple of minutes is to act as your interpreter. I'll translate the most compelling arguments into plain English, starting with the answer to question one. A normal elbow is a miracle of precision engineering. As such, normal function requires a million things to go right and nothing to go wrong. Now, elbows provide a junction between three cartilage surfaces. The level of the lower two surfaces must match perfectly. If not, that joint endures something it isn't designed to endure, namely peaks of pressure. Pressure peaks in an elbow cause rapid cartilage wear and fragmentation just as pressure peaks in a shoe cause blisters and hangnails. Now, this so-called step incongruity is a common cause of elbow dysplasia. When it's the cause, the two bones of the forearm act as magnifying lenses. The longer they are, the greater the potential for mismatched growth. And this is one of the reasons why large dogs are more prone than small dogs to severe elbow dysplasia. Now, step incongruity isn't the only cause of elbow dysplasia, but it is the easiest to understand. Fortunately, it's not important to understand all the triggers, but it is useful to recognise that what happens inside the joint is a consequence of abnormal growth outside the joint. In effect, the problem doesn't always start in the elbow, but the elbow pays the price for abnormal forelimb development. Which brings us to question two. What causes abnormal development? Before humans domesticated dogs, they were ruled by Darwin's laws of evolution. Only the fittest survived and nature had no patience for genetic frailty. If a young wolf had dysplastic joints, they couldn't hunt, they couldn't keep up with the pack and they couldn't reproduce. So harmful genes died with their owners. Effectively, before man was involved, nature had created a ruthlessly efficient breed improvement program. Now this perfect program ended the day man chose to domesticate dogs. The fittest were no longer those individuals who could fend for themselves. Their new ideal survival skills were loyalty and protective instincts. Man's best friend gradually evolved, but so too did man. His mental image of an ideal companion morphed, and it morphed to prioritise very specific shapes and sizes. In fact, man was so specific that in the last century, some breeding populations shrunk to less than 20 dogs each. Man was oblivious. He had no idea that his genetic tinkering would come at a cost. Sadly, his beloved dog was accumulating harmful genes, including genes which code for abnormal joint development. Can the same gene be simultaneously good and bad? To answer this question, we'll look at a relatively simple example, the HAS2 gene which makes Sharpay's wrinkly. Now, as well as creating wrinkles, the HAS2 gene has a dark side. It's implicated in a potentially serious condition called Sharpe fever. So in this example, a desirable feature, wrinkly skin, is literally inseparable from an undesirable feature, Sharpe fever. Now, although elbow dysplasia isn't caused by a single gene defect, the general principle applies. Namely, visible features we do want are closely related to invisible features we don't want. Another vivid example of a functional trade-off is a comparison between the low-risk greyhound, who was bred to sprint, and the high-risk pit bull, who was originally bred to fight. Bone quality in these two breeds evolved to match their function. 
So pit bulls have stronger bones and greyhounds have stiffer bones. And the difference is huge. For example, one study showed greyhound bones were up to 2.4 times stiffer than pit bull bones. So it's not only our dog's shape and size which evolved, it's also their material properties. Reducing risk would be easy if human choices were made using facts alone. In two to three generations, we could rid the world of hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia by crossing high-risk breeds with low-risk breeds. Now we know this for certain because it's already been done in experimental breeding colonies. But we are human, and humans don't make choices using facts alone. We have deep emotional ties to our favourite breeds, so we need to strike a balance. We need to preserve a high-risk external confirmation whilst finding a way to create a low-risk internal confirmation. Now it's wise to consider this reality if you're frustrated by the slow pace of breed improvement programmes. There's a good reason they're taking decades to effect modest improvements. Changing internal confirmation without changing external confirmation is very difficult. Imagine there was a human breed standard. An ideal height was six foot four. Now imagine your therapeutic goal was small feet. The correlation between height and foot size is 0 0.6. In other words, 60% of what makes a person tall also makes them have big feet. Now imagine how hard it would be to create a population of tall people with small feet. That's essentially what breed improvement programs are trying to achieve. Now thinking of genetic risk in terms of confirmation rather than individual genes explains another important truth. Breeds with a high risk for elbow dysplasia are often the same breeds who suffer a high risk of hip dysplasia and knee ligament injuries. Rottweilers, Bernese Mountain Dogs and Labradors are notable examples. Many genes code for an overall confirmation and it's that confirmation which in increases the risk of multiple joint diseases in the same individual. Confirmational risk also explains why responsible breeders can offer puppies with a lower than average risk, but even the most diligent breeders can't offer puppies with zero risk. If you'd like to learn more about hip dysplasia, ACL injuries and breed improvement programs, you'll find links in the comments section. But for now, we'll shift our focus away from population risk and onto individual risk. The short answer to the question, how do we limit individual risk is this. We limit risk by selecting puppies with a lower than average risk for that breed. Now, if you want the long answer, here it is. The relationship between genetic factors and physical development is measured using a statistic called heritability. Now, the ultimate measure of skeletal development is height, which in people has an estimated heritability of 0 0.79. This means genetic variation accounts for 79% of height variation within a population. Now it doesn't mean that 79% of individual growth potential is inherited from our parents, while 21% comes from the environment. In other words, if two individuals have adequate nutrition, we can't make one of them grow taller than the other using supplements or stretching. The same rules apply to inherited growth disorders, including elbow dysplasia. An estimated heritability of 0.3 doesn't mean we have a 70% chance of reducing an individual's elbow dysplasia risk by manipulating their environment. But you'll probably already know that this truth is largely ignored. Why? Because it doesn't suit our human affinity for simple solutions. We want to believe supplements or low impact exercise can reduce genetic risk. This yearning for simple yet implausible solutions explains why, in the veterinary world, Unpopular truths are often buried under a mountain of popular myths. But if you're interested in sifting through those myths to discover the truth about canine joint diseases, there's plenty more to come. So before you go, make sure you subscribe to the Vet Lessons YouTube channel.